So this, um, this sort of window into a uh, virtual world is the place that I started off in my um, interest in modeling of plants. So what we've got here is actually a, a, a scene that's uh, got these plants and um, uh, water lilies floating around in the pond and we're very interested in creating pretty pictures. Okay, so my background is in computer graphics and that I, I learned all, all, all about that in, in Canada where I was doing my master's and, and PhD. But what it turned out was that to get the, all those leaves and bits of stem in the right places, it was much easier to follow the way that the plant grows rather than just trying to put them in the right spots. And so I learned a lot about biology and um, people said, oh, hey Jim, come to Australia for three years. You can um, use your systems that you've used to make these nice pretty pictures and help us with our biology. And so I, I came here and it hasn't been winter yet, so I'm still here. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you Today is to talk a bit about the within plant part of functional structural plant models. That's the platform that, uh, that I'm using. And uh, then I'll look at a couple of uh, example applications that go beyond that. Um, insect behavior and simulation of spray canopy interactions. Just to give you some ideas about how these kind of models can work um, within and outside the plant. So first of all, what are these functional structural plant models? Um, well, if you think about it, the easiest way to get some information about a plant is to measure it and actually get some um, information into the computer that way. So you can see a little bit uh, younger version of myself with a bit bigger beard uh, measuring um, some plants and uh, with a, what's called a sonic digitizer. And you take that information and then you can create the structure of the plant. That's pretty easy. So, um, but what you'd like to do is then have some idea about how that structure develops. So what you can do is measure these, the plant as it grows over the weeks and then create a model that uh, can include roots and can include the shoot. And then um, by looking at the ways that the uh, plant generates more and more components in different patterns. You can um, capture the, uh, the growth of that plant. Um, so in this model, we have the roots and the shoots. And in the, the shoot part, we have a uh, um, a model that is always the same every time, but in the root part we have a model that reflects the uh, where the root's growing. It's actually causing the root to branch in different parts at different times. So we have a stochastic model. So it's in a, a useful element of the kinds of systems we're using. Um, just before I, I leave this one, I guess I should say that this is this piece of software here is called L Studio, and it's. Um, uh, I have little part of it. Um, my part is the uh, part that grows the plants. Uh, so the other bits and pieces that let us do things like, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, model leaves. So we can say something, actually this is my part too, sorry. <laughs> um, so here we can, use sort of computer aid design kind of techniques to um, change the structures of, of the bits and pieces that we're putting in the right places. Okay. So there's a whole package there. There's been, uh, I don't know how many PhDs and master's students that have worked on that software, but it's, it's uh, available from the University of Calgary where um, my advisor is now. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about how this this works. Um, and we'll use a bit more schematic kind of system here. So um, 
And let's rewind this. Uh, so what we think of is the plant as a uh, population of uh, apical meristems and the products that they, the pieces, bits and pieces that they produce. So this is a sort of the first level of uh, function that's going on in the plant that, that we're capturing this model. So an apical meristem uh, is defined by this rule here. You have an apical meristem and it produces a piece of internode, an axillary bud, a uh, new leaf, and the, the ongoing uh, meristem. And then these axillary buds might mature, leaves grow, and so on. So these are just rules that I've um, picked for this particular plant. And if we apply them, so the apex here will produce a new um, internode and so on, and the leaves will grow and the stems will grow. And with those four simple rules, you get a very nice structure. Uh, this is a bit two-dimensional, of course, but if you follow the way the plant works and rotate with phyllotaxis around for each node, you can change the three-dimensional structure and have a variety of plants all with the same thing just by changing the angle from one to the next. So this kind of rule system is something that I've put into a, a, a language that you can express models in. Okay. So from that uh, simple beginning, um, we went on to look at more and more complex um, within the plant types of uh, functions that we wanted to look at. And uh, one of the more recent pieces of work was this uh, kiwi fruit vine model, um, work with Mick Sislak and uh, Alice Deldesnova, who's over in New Zealand at uh, Plant and Food over there. And um, so the idea here is that we have our 3D architecture. We have those rules that say the patterns of branching and um, the rate of branching, the organ geometry. So you can make those nice little leaves the way you need them to be for the particular plant and how the bits and pieces are connected. Then we look at the environment. So temperature, light, um, the activity of the, uh, um, the farmer, what they're doing with their plants, and how that then affects the carbon dynamics of the plant. So within that plant structure, we can then model um, the movement of uh, carbon through the system, so from its acquisition. So the light that we are talking about in our exogenous factors, again, the leaves, we get photosynthate. Uh, we then look at how that is moved around in the plant, so that's a transport, and then the consequent organ growth. And we can also look at things like reserves and whatever other things. Now, carbon dynamics is just one area that we might look at. There are others as well. So this carbon then has an uh, impact on the growth factors, um, uh, developmental rates, timing of flowering, and so on. And we get back to our architecture. So we have a, a continuous circuit of these things. So this is just an example of how the light distribution, we have a <coughs> physics of light is very well understood. So um, you get these, uh, a program that will actually model the light in your uh, system. So the green guys here are getting the full amount of light that they would from overhead. This is midday, so it's just a straight overhead um, uh, light. And then the red ones are getting more there in the shade so they don't get as much. We can also look at things like integrating the light over 24 hours. So um, the ones that would get the full light uh, aren't quite there because in the afternoon they're shaded or in the morning they're shaded. So, But we can <coughs> get some idea of how light is going quite easily. Once we've got the light, we can then look at uh, the leaves as sources. We can say how much light went to this leaf. We can say how much photosynthate there was. And there's uh, a particular electrical analogy that we use to allocate carbon uh, between so sources and sinks. So it depends on source sink strength and the architecture of the plant, how these, this information is moved around. So this is um, sort of the result of that kind of work. Um, so it takes a little longer to run because it's a bit more complex kind of model. So um, I think the screens here are, are quite a bit 
between each other. It's not like sort of, sort of interactive level. So you have a trellis system that uh, 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 pergola, I think, that this particular kiwi fruit is on. And then you get the first flush in the spring. Um, you get flowering and then uh, some pruning. So what's happening now is that there's some pruning going on. So this is, of course, changing our source sink balance and um, preventing the uh, vegetative growth from taking over. And then the, uh, what we're really interested in is the um, final result on fruit or the yield of the plant. So these kinds of things let us look at different pruning strategies and different um, uh, ways of setting up the pergola, for instance, to see what uh, effects that might have on the plant. So this is ongoing work in, in New Zealand. They're, they're carrying on with this, um, adding more water types of activities into it, or water uh, activities, uh, the consequences of water stress. And um, this kind of model is what we're going to be using, and we have a... Uh, a big project with Horticulture Australia looking at um, trying to improve uh, tropical fruit cropping and we're going to try and use this kind of system to uh, work at that. But I think that's all we'll... Um, oh, I should say that we've got also... I guess a part of the work that we're doing is not just the biology but also looking at ways of improving the languages the language underneath that lets us describe how these bits and pieces fit together. So this particular um, paper is looking at, uh, we have our same carbon allocation kind of model, that, but we also look at uh, hormone flow, in this case auxin, that uh, might be affecting how the uh, branching patterns are going on. So how do you put those kinds of things together? So that's an important part of the kind of work that we, we do. Okay, so that's all I want to say about within the plant for the moment, because I want to um, talk a bit more about where we go beyond that. Um, we have already looked a little bit at the beyond part because we saw pruning. So that's a question, uh, something that the um, you can prune, and then the plant responds. So. In a, in a sense, that's uh, a combination of the two kinds of models. Um, but what I'm going to show you here is some work we've done with um, Miran Zalitsky's lab and Linda Perkins in particular, uh, looking at how we can model insect-plant reactions and how we can develop a better understanding of those kinds of systems using these kind of models. So this is the character that we're going to well, the, we've done the experiments with. Actually, Linda's done most of the experiments with. Uh, this is Helicoverpa armigera, and it's um, a larvae and that we're interested in. It gets laid on plants at some stage, and then they hatch out, and they wander around and um, eventually do lots of damage to uh, all kinds of different systems. They... Um, are in fruits and uh, corn and um, all sorts of things. So why is behavior of these insects uh, an interesting thing to look at? Well, if we can say something about why or how those insects move from the place where they come out of their egg to where they end up destroying the yield, um, maybe we can do something about uh, controlling it a bit better um, in different ways. So our aim then is to look at uh, observed behavior on plants and in particular we look at quite early instars of the uh, larva and see how it moves around to get to those locations. And then we create hypotheses about why is this insect doing what it's doing. And we can use then the models uh, of the insect to help us test those ideas to say, well, it, if, is it light, is it... Um, um, chemical sensing, is it um, whatever that, that we think might be uh, causing this insect to do what it does. And, um, and we can use the models to look at how those things interact because they're very complex. There's more than one thing happening at the same time. It's not like it's just a little robot. We don't know what the program is inside the, 
um, the larvae, so we want to understand what's going on. And then we can create models that um, and have our uh, simulated insects run around on them and uh, compare that to what we see in reality and see if our hypotheses are holding up for us. So here's uh, just something to oops, give you an idea of what, what we're talking about in terms of the modeling. So what we have is a growing plant and uh, our little bug on the left moves, uh, is just a bit faster than the guy on the right. So the idea is that you can see that um, the differences in behavior even as simple as just being moving at a different rate, are um, enough to cause a different result in the plant. Um, if I slowed them down just a bit more, that plant would just keep on growing and it would get away from them. Of course, you realize this bug is very, very slow because he's moving just about, he's moving way slower than the growth rate of the plant, isn't he? <laughs> in reality. So if you look at the model. But this is just an idea to show you what the kinds of things we want to look at. Okay. Okay, so how do we think about, we've talked about how we look at um, our plants and we think of them as these individual components with properties or parameters that let us determine things like biomass or uh, nutrient status or, or whatever. We want to do the same thing with our insects. So they're represented as individuals in what's called individual-based modeling. Um, and we use our parameters in our system to represent their internal states. So that might be things like age. It might be things like um, uh, gut contents. It might be things like um, uh, internal temperature. Uh, anything that we think we need in a hypothesis to, to talk about uh, that we think is of, co of consequence to behavior. So then we provide rules for how these states change, just like we provided rules for the apex, to say the apex produces an internode and a leaf. And um, then those states would then say, well, one of those states might be moving. And so movement is defined relative to the virtual plant that we're looking at. So we've got our structure. We can say it's moving in one direction or another on the structure. So then the next thing we have to think about is insect perceptions. What are they perceiving? Um, can they see the local plant architecture? Of course, we don't know how well they see. Um, and do they see color changes? Do they see uh, different things? Do they... Um, can they determine what can they determine to plant component properties? These are all things that can be tested in the lab to a certain extent. So we can say, do they like to eat? Is a component edible or not? Do they like to eat that component or don't they? Just by doing a, a, a choice test of some kind. Um, so that plant component properties might be something we're, we're getting information, the insect gets information about. We might look at microclimates. Um, this is more uh, of an ambitional thing at this point. We don't really have a lot to say about microclimates, except that if it's in the sun or not, we're very good at light, we can do light. So if, if something's in the light, we can say whether it's in the light or the shade. And then you can think about other insects. So here's an example with our other insects. So this sort of uh, very pink guy is, uh, you might think of as a ladybug or something like that is going around and eating the aphids. And I just made the aphids a bit movable so you could tell that they were there, what they were up to. So the, the things that, the, in terms of perceptions, you can see that the aphid, or the, uh, the bug has to decide on direction at, at a junction. It can also decide that um, these two leaves are connected and, and therefore can walk across, like you just, just did there. And then uh, perceiving the other, the food sources as they were. So, um, 
So we've got um, perceptions and we've got some internal states. But now for behavior, we also need to think about something a bit more abstract. Is it, um, can we think about those internal states and put them into some sort of abstract state that we, uh, things like hunger or moving or uh, escaping or those kinds of things. So those behavior states can be a hierarchical set of states that let us um, determine the behavior at any particular time. So we make decisions based on the state, the current state, and then perceptions. And probabilities of doing things based on the current state and perceptions let us provide a link to data. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Um, so then we use these probabilities uh, to look at state changes. So we have a state change machine essentially. And then we can say if it's eating, we're, we can affect the plant components. And if it's moving, we can move the guy around on the plant. So very simple kinds of ideas like if the state is searching and the leaf age is less than five, then um, leaf age indicating that it's probably good to eat or eat edible, um, we might change our state to feeding. So once we've got a bunch of rules like that into our plant, plant. so this is um, six plants that have had the same bugs running around on them and the uh, coloring of the leaves in, is indicative of the damage. Okay, so I run it quite long. They've all got a little bit of damage on them. Um, if they're green, there's no damage and if they're blue, there's lots of damage. So. Um, you can see it takes a long time to run. These guys just run around and they're, you can hardly see the changes in colors in a short time, but we let it run for quite a while and, um, and see the pattern of damage. So again, this is sort of a, an example of how these things might work. So on the right, I've got, right now everybody's got the same equal probability of, um, let's just uh, rerun that one. So it's equal probability of, of um, taking a choice at any point, whether it goes on the branch or the main stem. Um, and so you can see that with different probabilities you, or different insects, you get different patterns of damage. So if we change the left-hand three here, so it, they've got more of a chance of going upwards and run the, the model again, you'll see that we get uh, since they have a higher propensity going upwards, you get much more damage near the top of the plant and not so much down the bottom. Fair enough, same thing, kind of thing with the opposite. So this is something like you'd expect. So here's um, now a little bit less damage up at the top, more damage down the bottom, the color changes. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, simulations we'll do, except you do it with lots more um, examples and output the data to a file rather than visualizing it um, and then do analysis of the uh, results. So a bit about the, uh, the data that we're using to drive these models. Uh, this is work from Linda. Um, so the main thing that you notice with these little critters if you sit and watch them is that they do tend to move upwards in the plant and uh, there's lots of theories about what kinds of things are causing that. Um, they do tend to run a bit faster up if it's more vertical. So there's an idea that if they're on something that's vertical, it's, they go up. If they're on something that's horizontal, they, they slow down and look around. Because if you think about it, leaves are usually flat. And so maybe they're, if they're in a flat kind of space, that's, that's maybe a good place to be uh, feeding. So the other things are that you might have volatiles. You might be able to sense uh, smells from flowers or from leaves. Um, or you might be able to look at colors. So uh, Linda had a number of hypotheses about these things and she tested a bunch of them. So in this case, um, we're looking at the um, response to leaf or flower odors. So what she does is create a little Y tube 
a glass tube with a Y in it and then puts in one side a leaf and the other side nothing. One side some of this uh, acetate stuff one, or the aldehyde and one side nothing. And then looks at and sees where the insect goes and just sits here and watches them and puts another one and watches see where it goes and a lot of observational work. Okay, so, um, so with this particular uh, system, the chemotactic uh, for the uh, helicoverpa was that we found that there was not much difference. So it didn't seem like the pea leaves or the pea flowers or the chemicals that are known to be the active ingredients uh, are attracting these particular insects. Okay, so pretty much 50-50. One, this is the one with the control and this is the one without, with the actual material in it. So no response to smells, which is great because smells, of course, would be very difficult to model in the, how would you decide where they were going? You'd have to think about air movement. You, it's good that they didn't react to that very much. <laughs> um, well, you could just, I guess you could say, well, they're up here, so there's more likely more spell, smell closer. So you could do something like that quite easily. Um, so attraction to light. Uh, so here she puts them in a, a box and sees where they move. Um, puts them in uh, one end, has a light at the other end, and sees what percentage of the, the larvae move towards it. So it's not all of them. So you can see it's a little bit under 80%. Um, with a white light there, they're all moving there. She broke it up into blues and greens and ultraviolet and found the ultraviolet didn't attract them as much. It was about 50% moving towards it as a way. Uh, but found in the dark that they didn't tend to like to move. So light is a, it's a common the hypothesis that light is one of those things that takes them up in the plant. But what about a response to gravity? So um, this is again looking at the percentage of the caterpillars that are moving upwards. And um, you can see that in the flat, so this one degree is one degree from horizontal. And um, the, uh, not much difference between on a one degree whether they went one way or another. But as you move up um, to 90 degrees vertical um, structures, then, then there's way more that move upwards. Okay, so this is the, our target plant that we're using, is, which is a garden pea. This is a fancy one, I think, with um, all tendrils, right? But it gives you a good example of, of, of the angles of these bits and pieces. So you can see that the, the main stem is quite vertical. So are these leaves. Or, uh, um, um, and then the petioles are off at different angles and different parts, little... Hmm? Stipules, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and a much smaller percentage actually has the side branch. So just assuming that they just walk up and they don't see very well, so they just, whatever they run into. So just percentage chance uh, is what, what we use for that. And then, of course, you have to look at uh, what happens when there are um, more than one of these things is happening at the same time. So over on the left here, so the orange guys, the brighter orange guys are moving up and the red brownie guys are moving down. Uh, so the little light bulbs indicate the location of the, the light source for these things. And then these is 10 degrees, 50 degrees and 90 degrees. So you can see that it seems like um, you get a, a bit more influence when they're on a vertical surface, they like to move. Um, but the direction seems to be more defined in these two by the direction of the light. And if you look at the case where we have light in both cases, well, they get a little confused, which way should I go? They, um, um, they're using that cue of the vertical uh, to be saying, let's go, and they're using the light as uh, a, a directional thing. And then, so this gray one in, in the dark is actually not moving at all. And so you can see that they do tend to go up if there's no light, even though that, um, despite the fact that these tend to be towards light. Um, yeah, so you gotta sort of put them in the dark and then open it up and have a look and see what's there. 
Okay, so this is how the program works then. It sort of has uh, a few things like age, depends, when they're first, uh, first hatch, they, they don't eat right away, so there's a little bit of time, 24 hours, where they're doing something that doesn't involve edibility or not. Uh, so that's why we're asking how old I am. Um, so then there's this question of edible and inedible parts of the plant. What is the angle? And if you wonder why they might be able to sense gravity, well, it's just uh, a matter of their um, different parts of their uh, segmented body that actually can determine where, uh, which way they're headed. Okay, so they've got sensors in there that actually tell them that. So, for instance, if with this little guy, you might have a probability of going up 70% down, 10% and staying 20% because he looks like he's on something a bit yummy. So we then put these into our um, uh, models of the pea plant, which is a bit more realistic now. And we have our little insects that run around and we do this for hundreds of plants and collect the statistics about um, how long they're on different pieces, where they are at different times, how far they get um, in their travels. And we compare this then to data that we collect on the same thing from, from uh, the lab where we're look, looking at the larvae running around on the plants. So with a simple geometry, we had the first go with just saying, oh, well, let's just a very simple idea of, of geometry. And we have sort of a 45 degree angle kind of guy here with a PDO and um, our stipule. And um, so here's the runs. So this is, uh, we have uh, simulations are in the white and the black is the real system, the data from the real system. And this is the count of the number of nodes moved. So um, what Linda would be doing is looking at uh, putting the insects on a certain location in the plant and coming back a little later and saying, well, how far have they gone? Um, um, she also did a lot of studies of actual movements and where they were in different times. It's a lot, a lot of work. Um, but this is a good indication of what's going on. So you can see here that we uh, didn't do too badly. Um, we got a, a bit more in our simulations that stayed where they were than where they, um, than we would have expected. Um, but in their, in terms of the nodes, number of nodes moved, we didn't do too badly. But in our final locations, uh, our rules are clearly off here in the leaf. So in the real system, there are lots of them on the leaves, and in our um, simulated system, we ended up with more of them on the tendrils. And this is partly because we sort of put the tendrils as a special place where they like to go because we had a hypothesis that that was the case. So this was a good indication that that wasn't it going on. So we looked at a bit more realistic geometry in our, in our simulation. And um, so you can see here now you have different angles within the leaf so that once they get out here towards the tendril, they can actually say, oh, up is that way, I should go back. Um, and looking at the plant, this is in fact the case. You can see that that's what's going on. So here we, uh, our nodes moved again are, are, are reasonable, uh, but our final locations came back to a certain extent, but not all the way. So we're still working on that part of the model. So I guess we got model development can gives us some insight. Uh, it made us look at different ideas about how this insect behavior is working in terms of like the, the structure of the plant a little bit more than we would have otherwise. They gave us some guidance for real experiments and, um, and once you've got these kind of tools you can use them uh, to, to express different hypotheses and you can use them in education and extension. And ongoing work here is incorporating induced plant defenses. So if you have damage from the uh, insect plant induces some chemicals, maybe the insects don't want to be there anymore. Uh, haven't quite, we've done, they've been doing the uh, experimental work, but we haven't done any modeling on that. So, um, my other, my next example of beyond the plant um, is looking at spray canopy interactions. So this is work I've done with Ian Turner and is a mathematician at uh, QUT, and we have a linkage grant and uh, Gary is a 
postdoc on that grant. He works out at Gatton, uh, and they have a nice uh, facility that's a spray tunnel, and um, a wind tunnel, so they can actually do the spray experiments, and uh, they got laser systems that measure the droplets and all sorts of fancy things like that. So we use that to collect information about our droplets. So what we've got then is the idea that we have spray coming out of a, um, a, a sprayer, a spray head, and a different spray head will have different characteristics um, of droplets that come out of it and at different speeds. And then we're looking at um, they run these kind of tests in the in the wind tunnel, but we'd like to be able to say, well, let's. What happens if we um, do we understand what's going on with these spray spray canopy interactions, and what's happening to the spray once it gets onto the uh, different components? So here we've got um, um, the green has got no spray, and then different colors of shades of um, red and yellow have different amounts of spray on them. Uh, the droplets here, by the way, are about 200 times normal size, so just so you can see them. Um, they wouldn't, wouldn't be very visible at this kind of speed. Now you can see we got some on the ground here in the blue. So the idea is that we're getting better control of the system and can reduce environmental imp impacts when we're um, doing this. So structural plant model provides a target again and we have a model of spray. So just like we had our uh, models of insects as little individuals, we have our models of droplets as little individuals. And we have this sort of a two-phase flow going on. There are liquids dispersed in uh, airflow. So we have to take account of both those systems when we're modeling this. So we have to have a model of airflow and droplet movement in the airflow. And our work so far is concentrated on the droplet movement in the airflow. And then the, once the droplets have hit the uh, plant, what the results are in terms of uh, droplet movement around on the, on the uh, structure itself. So this is, uh, Gary's got high-speed cameras and things that he can take pictures of the uh, as well as the laser system for measuring things. So this is a, a close-up of the spray head. Uh, so you can see close to the nozzle is very dense and um, it's actually uh, sucking the air along with it. And um, then as it moves away, it, it uh, breaks up and eventually becomes the spray droplets. So uh, at medium distances, we got air moving with the droplets and you can have vortices in, in the, um, the air and not to mention uh, this sprayer is actually moving through so it's got turbulence as well. So these vortices and turbulence we're not modeling uh, to a great extent yet. Uh, it's, it's one of those future things. And once you get away from the nozzle then the spray is more dilute and you get droplets influenced by prevailing conditions. So this is the part away from the nozzles that we're, we're uh, modeling. And so we use empirical data from these kind of uh, experiments where we can see how many droplets we got and how fast they're moving. And we don't worry about what's happening at these closer times. Um, so the particle trajectory model is partly ballistic and partly random walk model. So ballistic in that the um, droplets are, are sprayed out at a certain speed and with certain weights and um, trajectories. And then we take account of gravity and see where they go. And, but it's also random walk in that the air influences where they're going. So we use the random walk kind of model. And we um, basically, it's got to do most with um, the size of the particle and how much. So the bigger particles are more ballistic, and the uh, smaller particles are more um, a random walk. And those small ones are the ones that make for the, the bad um, um, material off the off target uh, drops, drift, and those kinds of things. So then the idea is that we can simulate this over a whole crop. Um, this kind of model is I've got it here in an animation because it takes a long time to run uh, this kind of thing because we're tra tracing lots of drops. Um, 
So here's some data that we uh, came out of this work. Uh, for cotton, we've got um, pretty good uh, comparison between our simulation experiments. But for things like sow thistle, for instance, we've got not very good. Uh, so this is, these are significantly different at this, at this level. And um, so this sow thistle is actually uh, interesting. It's got a, a hard to wet surface. So this is an indication that maybe we need to think about, well, it's not just, uh, it's think droplets are dropping off and so on. So now what we need to do, or what we're working on actually uh, on this current linkage is uh, adding a droplet bounce model and improved shatter and adhesion components and um, a few new target plants and leaf models and uh, looking at creating an easy to use interface for the um, people who are interested um, are chemical companies, that's who the linkage is with and um, um, the guy that's out there talking to um, extension people and saying here you want to spray like this because of this, and they, he wants to have a model that he can show them and say, "Look, this this is the kind of thing that that I'm talking about," because um, <laughs> sometimes easier to use um, that way. So, um, so we we have these kind of models. We have insects. We have sprays. We could look at interactions between them. Uh, plant pathogen interactions could also be done in the same kind of sense. You got pathogens on the plant. Splash dispersal of pathogens is one of the big uh, ways that pathogens get around. Um, and then you could also think about multitrophic interactions where you have um, insects that you're introducing to help control your pests. Um, okay, so I hope you've got an idea that um, about what the how the structures of the models can let us uh, look at what's going on inside the plant, but also once you've got that structure, you can deal with things that are going on around the plant, from the farmer to um, with his spray or um, whatever, or just or just rain for that matter. Um, so Chemik Prusinkevich is the guy with the L Studio software and the uh, bunches of uh, post -grad st or graduate students that have worked on it and uh, of course we've had some funding from the Australian Research Council to get us through here. So, thanks. Hey.